Hello? That's audible, okay, great. Hello. Sorry. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Archives of uh, Contemporary India at Ashoka and the Department of History uh, to welcome my old friend, uh, uh, Professor Dilip Menon, who is at the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa, where he's uh, uh, founder director of the Center for Indian Studies in Africa. Uh, Professor Menon is, of course, a historian of repute uh, for, whose work uh, is well known to all of us, Caste and Communism. Uh, a classic on Malabar. Uh, his recent works, there are many, just a very quick list, the edited work Changing Theory 2021 and two co-edited books last year, short titles are Ocean as Method and Cosmopolitan Cultures and Oceanic Thought. His next project is even more exciting and we hope on his next visit he will tell us about it. It's an ERC project on Indian politics in its vernaculars, uh, which includes scholars of 19 languages. I think that's absolutely fascinating. But I'm glad to say that today's topic sounds even more so. It is the archive of the demotic thinking theory from our spaces. Professor Menon, uh, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to him here at Ashoka. Thanks. Uh, so thank you for having me. And uh, oh, this is actually a part of the project that uh, Mahesh mentioned, where we have a, a European Research Council project, which involves 19 of us working in 19 Indian languages. And the idea is to think about uh, the larger project that I've been engaged in for the last decade of how do we create a social science vocabulary from our spaces. Because very often, uh, as we know, in it's not only in India, but generally in the global south, we leap blindly from Medinipur to Levinas you know, in search of uh, theoretical paradigms. And it's a kind of uh, sophistication with uh, contemporary European theory that uh, makes our work sophisticated. And very often we are also working with what Ganesh Devi wrote in his wonderful book in the 1990s, that those who are in the colonial spaces live after amnesia. That there is a way in which we are not cognizant of the intellectual traditions that we possess. Uh, we are not familiar with traditions of classical philosophy. What would you like me to do? I'm combo left. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the question really was then is that if we are to think about intellection from our spaces, what is the strategy that one needs to adopt? I mean, does one then say, let's go back to the Vedas, let's go back to classical Indian philosophy, if you belong to a particular stream of thought, or do we say, shall we go back to the uh, generations of Indic texts, as it were, and you think about Jain, Buddhist, and other traditions. So one of the ways in which uh, we, I tried to work through this was in the book uh, that I edited, Changing Theory. Uh, concepts from the global south, where we got together scholars working across disciplines, work who all worked with the language. So we had 20 essays in 16 different languages, ranging from Arabic to Zulu to Posa to uh, Mandarin and so on and so forth. And the idea was really something that seemed initially quite arbitrary, but that was the strategy, right? So I said, just choose a word that you wish to work with. And it was a literary, philosophical, theoretical exercise where one begin, began then to engage with the conceptual entailments of that word. That word had to be fleshed out. So one of the things that it did was to free us, in some sense, from the idea of a tradition that sat on our shoulders, so to speak. Right? Where if you were to take up a word like dharma, for example, or yin and yang, or ubuntu, words which are in the common, uh, you know, one could think about more sophisticated words which are rooted in particular philosophical schools, and that would require for many of us who lived after amnesia to begin a lifetime enterprise. So for the last 10 years, I've been trying to read classical Indian philosophy, and I can't say I've got very far, because it's another paradigm. It's not an inheritance. And that inheritance has been denied to us by the colonial caesura, as it were, that break that has happened. So the archive of the demotic is how we are trying to work through this large project with the ERC. And so in one sense, this will be the introduction to this book that I am now editing a volume on obedience and the idea of obedience in Indian politics, where we are trying to put together essays from these 19 Indian languages. Obedience as it works its way through the domestic, 
relations with filial relations, parental relations, the idea of obedience as it works out in structures like caste, the idea of obedience as it works out within political practice, political parties, the idea of wood bank, which M. N. Srinivas spoke about, and so on and so forth. So this project of thinking a conceptual vocabulary from our spaces, so to speak, and I do this twitch because uh, people will immediately ask, so what do you mean by our here? And who does it include and so on? And I'll assume that you shall be compassionate enough to take it for granted that our means something to you. So it's a project of thinking uh, conceptual vocabulary from our spaces, from the South Asia, India, from the global South. And in many senses, this is a project that was inaugurated more than 50 years ago. Right? So when you uh, think about Ngugi Wathiongo's decolonizing the mind, his decision to move away from writing in English to writing in Gikuyu, or you think about the early works of people like Ashish Nandi, the intimate enemy, loss and recovery of self under colonialism, Syed Farid Alatas, the uh, lazy native. So across the decolonized world in Malaysia, India, Africa, people were thinking about this inheritance of English and what to do with it. And there is a famous debate between Chinua Achebe and uh, Ngugi as to should one write in English or not? And Chinua Achebe is very pragmatic about this. English is what English does, right? So it's just a language that needs to be used. And that pragmatic relation to language is also a politics because in many senses to go back behind this, behind this violent acquisition of language was not possible, right? So to go back to some of those debates is something that I've been trying to do because as all of you know or should know, originality is 1% inspiration and 99% amnesia. So there is a lot of work that has preceded us, and very often we are revisiting debates that have happened much earlier. And so we are familiar with some of these debates. I mean, I don't have to rehearse for you the work of Dipesh Chakravarti or Suzukta Kaviraj's wonderful idea of Euro-normality, right? That uh, our histories are written with historical trajectories that come with elsewhere. It's a plangent phrase that Tagore speaks about in his lectures on nationalism that we can't write our histories with histories that come from elsewhere, and so on. And one of the problems with post-colonial theory was that even as it freed us from a certain kind of dependence on uh, traditions of Occidental intellection, it also required us in many ways to locate oneself within that. One had to jump the hoops, as it were. And so you'll find, so those of you who've read uh, Provincializing Europe, at the heart of it lies the tragic uh, enunciation where Dipesh Chakravarti says that we have the gift of the enlightenment. Right? So there is a contending against the enlightenment, but at the same time, the enlightenment is the gift that allows us to think, to allows us to locate ourselves, to allow us to engage in conversation, as it were, with a vast philosophical tradition. And it's that tension, that contradiction, and this is not intended as a criticism, right? but that is the tension that we embody in the spaces that we inhabit. And postcolonial theory also worked with what I call in my work, the abbreviated time of modernity. So in many senses, very often thinking about self, politics, ethics, all of these are regarded not only as conceptual categories, but as temporal categories that certain ideas of freedom and so on have been inaugurated. So the French Revolution is the beginning of most things for the French, uh, not for everybody else. And the French Revolution is also the beginning of colonialism for France, but that's another history. We'll leave that aside. So this question of the inauguration of certain modes of thinking, certain conceptualizations of self are related to the time of modernity. Now, modernity is not, as we know, a temporal category. It's a judgment. It's a political judgment on certain spaces. And that is the way our, the political economy of our world is constructed, that there are spaces that are modern, not modern, and so on. This is something that Dipesh has written about uh, in his wonderful resonant phrase of people who are condemned to live in the waiting room of history. Or you think about Johannes Fabian and the idea of the denial of coevalness that people in Africa and Europe live at the same time, but not in the same time, right? You know, those kinds of issues. So what we have here when we think about recovering intellection from our spaces is not a going back, right? And not a search for authenticity, 
uh, there is no there there when you get there, so to speak, as Gertrude Stein might have put it. It's not an uncritical embrace of nativism. So just in case uh, there are any proto Sai Deepaks in the audience, that's not the route that I'm going to take here. Uh, but the, it's, it's the important thing really is that of trying to think with the idea of tradition in a way that is what uh, Nandi, uh, the much maligned Dashish Nandi called critical traditionalism, right? That there is an engagement with tradition that is critical. And this is something that is the foundation of much of uh, European philosophy. Because when we think about Plato and Aristotle, they, they were philosophers who sanctioned and worked with slavery. When we think about Kant, Kant was a misogynist, Kant was also a racist. But we recover, we recuperate a philosophy despite that. So similarly, with our traditions, our Hindu traditions are mired in patriarchy and multiple forms of hierarchy, but we have to recuperate something from here, and that's a task, that's the work that needs to be done. The work of mere critique, I think, is over. Right? To just to say, uh, speak about Eurocentrism and all the rest of it, you've done that for the last 30 years. So there is work to be done, and that's really what we are trying to do here. So Changing Theory, the volume that I edited, brought together scholars from Africa, from the Middle East, and it was premised on not only the fact that you needed to engage with text, that you needed to engage with spaces and people. So we held conferences in Beirut, in parts of Africa, and we brought together scholars who actually were for the first time speaking to people from Ghana, speaking to someone from Lebanon for the first time. And there was something exciting about that exchange because you realized over the course of a week that there was a question of a geography of affinity, right? that there were people who were thinking about similar problems uh, because of the weight of something that they felt that they had lost. The, the, the weight of something that they felt they had to create afresh, create something new. And so those conversations were uh, tense, they were contradictory, but they were also, uh, in many senses, exciting, precisely because of the fact that we seem to have a common enterprise. And the idea of the global south was used as a placeholder. Now, I mean, very often you find the cynicism regarding the idea of the global south. I'm not cynical, but nor do I embrace it as an idea. It's not a geographical idea, as you all know. It's not everything south of the equator. The Global South is a project, and the project means very many different things to very many people who work with the idea. And uh, But increasingly, the kind of uh, problem that you've had with the idea of the Global South is the urgent and exigent question of global warming and the fact that we live in the age of the Anthropocene with water up to our necks. So what does it mean then to think about the first world, the second world, the third world, the global so south and the global north, when we have to think about the globe, right? And this is something that Dipesh Chakravarti's more recent work thinking about the planetary is reminded of, that we have this one world, one world or one planet. There is no planet B, as they say, right? So what do we do with this? And so we're moving increasingly to conceptualizing the idea of trans-hemispheric conversations. And that's really, a, again, a kind of placeholder, right? I mean, a lot of these conceptual categories are things that allow you to think and move beyond. So in the uh, changing concepts uh, theory from the global south, uh, or changing theory concepts from the global south, to give you a sense of the words that we use, the idea was, as I said at the beginning, not to work with words that came from a tradition of thinking, from Imangsa or you know, uh, Akhlaq literature or whatever it is. So one of the words that uh, is bookend, I mean, the, uh, or ends the volume is a, a word in Urdu and Persian, uh, Hindi, Hindustani, a word that uh, Francesca Orsini, whom all of you know about, has written. And the essay is on the word Aukath, right? And the word Aukath is an interesting word uh, because what Francesca does is to explore the 18th and 19th century dictionaries and to look at the meaning of Aukath. And all of you are aware, I mean, this is something that circulates in everyday speech. Right? And this is something that comes up in the most melodramatic of Hindi films as well, right? And so on and so forth. But the question is here is that the word Aukath is also related to the word Vakth just time. So here you have a word that is a question of status, which is connected to the question of time, and they join like Siamese twins. 
And what it gives us is a kind of portmanteau concept, as it were, that status in, is indeed a matter of time. So in uh, Francesca's essay, we move from the 19th century dictionary, which gives us the idea of our car in its linguistic landscape. And then she moves forward to the 1990s, where you have the emergence of Dalit literature, you have the coming to power of Mayavati as the first Dalit chief minister in India, where formerly untouchable castes are asking upper castes, kya hai, that you can treat us this way. So vakt and aukat come to be tied together, right? It's a matter of a transition that is happening here. Similarly, another word that which was a very resonant word was a word in Zulu. Now, this is when we talk about words, we talk, the obvious thing is that we work with words around us. What does it mean to work with a word that is no longer around us? A word that has, because words live and words die, and no, there has been no better philosopher of this than Ganesh Devi, right? About the languages that are dying, even as we sit here and speak. And so this word, has a very interesting history. It's a word in Zulu, Izitungutu, and it's a word that means nothing to the contemporary Zulu speaker. The way it arises is out of a typical colonial enterprise where James Stewart, a colonial official, is compiling a dictionary. So he arrives in the city of Durban and summons people, and which is what, you know, it's like a ferman. So everyone comes and they are asked, so we say love in our language, what do you say? We say community, what do you say? I mean, what is the word for king, realm, territory, and so on? And word of this gets down deep into the heart of uh, the Zulu territory, and an old man of 80 called Tununu uh, decides that there's something happening here which he needs to engage with. He's distantly related to the great Shaga, Shaga Zulu. So he decides to take a train, which has just been introduced, and he takes the train to Durban at the age of 80, frail man that he is. He lands up before James Stewart, who is excited. He's suddenly faced with this gentleman in front of him who is from the royal family, and Stewart belabors him, you know, pesters him with questions about words and origins and so on. And Tununu turns to him after an hour of this and says, all you have to do is read and write. As for me, I'm easy Tungutu. And James Stewart is startled, excited. He's never heard this word before, so he makes a marginal annotation in the dictionary. That's how we know the word, right? And it exists only as a marginal annotation. It doesn't enter the dictionary. You know, what did Tununu mean? All you have to do is read and write. As for me, I'm easy Tungutu. What he meant was to convey something that was a complex idea which could not be reduced to the word. And the idea was the sense of discomfiture felt when your questions are not my questions. Right? It, is the, it is the classic description of a colonial encounter. What you ask me is not my questions. And I don't know how to answer this. So easy Tungutu is a word that comes up here, which again uh, probably has manifest, you know, multi manifold conceptual entailments that we could think about. So when we think about this theory in, of uh, politics in India, India's politics and its vernaculars, which is the contemporary project, one of the things that we're very clear about is precisely the sense of easy Tungutu, that our questions need not be the questions of what are political theory, history, philosophy, and so on, which are given to us, which are present before us in our pedagogy, our institutional structures, our intellectual engagements, and it's not the search for equivalence or of commensurability. There is no easy translation available because a lot of our earlier engagements have been, do we have a political theory in India? Do we have the state in India? Do we have civil society in India? And we say, no, we don't have civil society. What we have is something called political society and so on and so forth. So there's multiple kind of, uh, it's a bit like uh, you know, watching a buffalo in a swamp and it keeps rolling around in it and not really getting out of it. So the question here is that instead of moving away from the search for equivalence and commensurability, we have to ask the question, what do we have? It's a very simple question, what do we have here? It might not relate at all to the inheritance that we have in, uh, you know, from, of this thing called political theory. And I remember being at a conference of the PHSPC, uh, which came out of multiple volumes, you know, in India, we have all of these 
abbreviations and acronyms and so on, which are funded by the ICHR and the ICPR. And, and at that point, that volume was devoted to, is there a political theory in India? And the answer was, yes, there is, because we have the state, we have civil society, we have republicanism, we have rights and so on, rather than asking the question, what are the forms of political association, forms of political life in India? And one of the things here is this fundamental question of generating a conceptual vocabulary that we can work with. And to go back to a book that has never left me. When I was an undergraduate was when Ashish Nandi's uh, Intimate Enemy, Loss and Recovery of Self Under Colonialism was published. And there is a wonderful phrase in that I'd like to quote. And he says, the meek inherit the earth, not by meekness alone. They have to have categories, concepts, and even defenses of the mind, right? A more clear statement of a program that has still yet to be worked out 40 years down the line, right? So that's really something that I'd like to leave before you, the task of construction, the work that needs to be done rather than the mere critique. So I began reading many of the things that I had read in the 80s and one of the books that I began with was Edward Said's Beginnings, because I was beginning something, the Shuharam, as it were. So I began to read with, read Edward Said's Beginnings in order to understand for myself, what does it mean to begin? What does it mean to begin something that is new? Or to imagine that one is beginning something new? Because there is no leap, in, you know, uh, there are no Archimedean points and there can't be leaps away into some kind of vastness. And one of the things that uh, Edward Said speaks about his intention and method, and these are crucial in the idea of beginning. And the question of intention, Said argues, is the link between the idiosyncratic view and the communal concern, right? So when you think about the fact that you might say, well, you know, you're choosing words like Aukathya, Izitungutu, it appears to be an idiosyncratic method. Right? where you're choosing words, you're working with a word that you're familiar with, you're working with a word that you want to, which appears rather willful, given the fact of an academic tradition that exists before you. So the question here is the communal concern. The communal concern is really about generating a social theory from our spaces, generating a conceptual vocabulary from our spaces, contending against the amnesia that has been generated by what Maria Lugones called the colonial womb. Right? So we are, in some sense, consider working with the idea of making or producing difference, combining the familiar with work in the human language. This is again, I'm paraphrasing Saeed. So you're producing difference through combining the familiar words, everyday words, the demotic, with human work in language. So there is the question of that inheritance. The unthought inheritance, what Bhurti would say, it comes without saying, therefore it goes without saying. You know, the kind of the notion of habitus, words that you use you know, commonly, and the work that is required to reveal, as it were, the universe that word occupies. And the object here is not to be outside of tradition in some kind of intransigent way. Right? It's not to say, well, I, I shan't deal with Indian classical theory or Confucianism and so on. It's not to be outside tradition, but as Said puts it, again, very simply, but in a very uh, sharp way, it is to be beside tradition. And what does it mean to be beside tradition? It brings up the question of filiation, right, of connections. So you're not setting something aside. You're not deriving from it. You're sitting beside it and observing the filiations, not only with the tradition, but the filiations with the everyday, which is the work that one is doing. And to think with the work of uh, an anthropologist who I deeply admire, Eduardo de Viveros Castros, what he says is that when we look at studying indigenous thought or indigenous thinking, and the word indigenous, as we know, itself is a detritus of colonialism and modernity and so on. So, uh, I, I hope you will grant me the charity to assume that there are all these debates that we're all familiar with, we're all reading from the same page, uh, that it's not an indigenous manner of thinking, but it's objects. It's not a distinctive manner of thinking. So 
to go back to somebody like K.K. Ramanujan's wonderful essay, wonderfully ironic essay, is there an Indian way of thinking, which doesn't provide us with an answer. I mean, it's a bit like, can the subaltern speak? And, the, and if you read Gayatri's work and some people say the answer is yes, and some people say the answer is no. And here too, is there an Indian way of thinking? Perhaps. And the, that ironic engagement with the idea where it's not an indigenous manner of thinking, but the objects, what is it that is thought about? Right? That's really at the heart of it. So we are really speaking about some kind of a philosophical anthropology, as it were, which looks at words in their context, words that speak to and generate forms of identity, create identity, stem from identity, are conjunctural, are transient, and you can multiply the adjectives. Most of us have good enough vocabularies to do that, so I'll leave it there. So it's a philosophical activity that continues to maintain a meaningful relation with life. And we'll come back to why I say that, a meaningful relationship with life, a demotic theorizing. Uh, and the idea of demotic, I've just put up there, uh, the meanings of the, of the word demotic. Is any, anyone able to read that? Anyone has 2020 vision? No. Okay, so demotic. Uh, relating to or denoting uh, everyday speech and writing, denoting or relating to the kind of language used by ordinary people, you know, the idea of democracy, deriving from demos, democracy, and so on and so forth. I just put that out there to tell, show you that I use the dictionary once in a while. Uh, but this, for me, is at the heart of demotic thinking, uh, reading Bakhtin, the dialogic imagination. And again, to go back to some of these thinkers whom we no longer read, right? And to go back to the idea of amnesia and originality, right? So here I'd like to uh, read out, usually where PowerPoint is meant for other people to read, but I just want to read out bits for you and which are marked out in red there. So language for the individual consciousness lies on the borderline between oneself and the other. And this is the important uh, idea that I'm working with. The word in language is half someone else's. It becomes one's own only when the speaker populates it with his own intention, his own accent, when he appropriates the word, adapting it to his own semantic and expressive intention. There's the question of taking the word, seizing the word. It's a, it's a kind of Benjaminian moment, as it were, where you reach back in a moment of danger that flash of illumination that makes the past meaningful for you or makes a word meaningful for you. Prior to this moment of appropriation, the word does not exist in a natural and impersonal language. Remember, these are Bakhtin's, uh, this, it's Bakhtin's discontentment with philology, the dead, dead weight of language, as it were. The word does not exist in a natural and impersonal language. And here is the killer phrase. It is not, after all, out of a dictionary that the speaker gets his words. Rather, it exists in other people's mouths. Right? And that's the idea of demotic that we are trying to work with, where we are really thinking about the fact that words circulate in people's mouths. Words live, words die, words are transformed by context, words acquire new meanings, and so on and so forth. So this is the heart of the so after all this philosophical guff, now I shall move straight to the empirical uh, so that uh, I think we can get a sense of where all of this is going, right? Rather than staying at the realm of... Uh, so uh, in an ironic mode, just in case you're unable to recognize this, I begin with the dictionary, even though it's not out of a dictionary that people get their words. So I'm here and trying to think with a word uh, in Malayalam, uh, since that's my language, a word which is called udukkam. I'll write it for you because I realize in various talks that I've done that even what, what comes so easily, you know, glides of my tongue, people don't seem to get it. I'll write it in Hindi. So that's how it's pronounced. It's written as utukkam, but it's pronounced as udukkam, right? So in the questions, I shall expect you to pronounce it like that. So what I'll do is I'll start with uh, Hermann Gundert's dictionary in 1872, what is called the classic Malayalam Nighandar, which uh, Hermann Gundert, the Basel mission missionary living in Malabar does, where what he attempts to do with English uh, and Malayalam is very much what uh, 
James Stewart was doing in South Africa, where he's drawing upon a range of resources, the Talisheri court records, East India Company records, conversations in Menon's, Menon means overseer or accountant, uh, with the general population hanging around at religious festivals and so on and so forth. So it's a work of uh, philosophy, it's a work of anthropology, it's a work of history, it's a work of, and so on and so forth. So what he says about the word, what the meaning of the word udukkam is that it's related to obedience, to suppression, to containment. The word as it circulates in everyday Malayalam, right? And this is not a word that exists only in the dictionary. People use the word udukkam in a variety of occasions. So for example, if I'm in Trivandrum or in Kodikod and it's evening and I hail an auto, the auto will say, Sare petilya, udukkam unduvana. Meaning, I can't do it for you, sir. I'm going to put it away, right? Or you walk into a second class compartment and you throw your things around and they say, please put it all together. And there's the other way in which at homes, right, where young girls might sit in a casual way in front of guests and so on, the mother will say, you need to be, you need to have a sense of comportment. So you can see what is circulating. It's a form of discipline. Ranging from Gundert's example of suppression, and the first example he gives is actually of Tipu Sultan being udukofied, as it were, to use a Salman Rushdie chutneyfied word, or where he, uh, where Tipu Sultan is suppressed, is made obedient to this every day. And by the time of uh, Sri Gandan Nair's uh, dictionary in 1923, the word udukam has begun to acquire the common everyday. Uh, sense of the word that is used in every Malayali home. And you'd probably have Bengali, Marathi, and other equivalents for this, where the young girls are taught about udukkam, right? That you don't laugh too loudly, you don't sing at night, you don't comb your hair in front of people, and you can multiply them. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't need to explain this to you. And there's also this uh, thing where a teacher in a government, one of my friends who went from Delhi, to teach in a government school in Kerala. And she said one of the things that would happen is there'd be these benches and they'd be, she was teaching in a girls' school and the girls would be sitting on the benches and the teacher would say namaste and then she would do this, you know, getting the girls to put their legs together. Right? So the namaste was coordinated into a very fluid gesture. And that was what udukkam is about, feminine comportment. So what I want to do here is to think about this word as it circulates in Kerala and constructs a political space. What you have here is a gory scene. Many of you know, uh, some of you know, some of you may not know. North Kerala has been at war in many senses for the last 70 years or more, where the CPM, the Communist Party of India Marxist, and the RSS have been at war with each other, where the CPIM Udukkofai, so to speak, the RSS. Right? The idea, because Kerala, many of you may not know, has the largest number of RSS shakhas in India, over 5,000, even more than UP. These are sleeper cells, as the, you know, to, and one doesn't know what will happen, but they are there. And the only way they are kept under control is through this internecine warfare. The saffron villages and there are red villages, a wonderful book that's come out by Ruchi Chaturvedi this year from Colombia. Right? So this question of Udukkam, is very central to the political practice the, of the Communist Party in Kerala. And it's a very male political practice. Right? It's a patriarchal violence in the sense that these conflicts are happening between men and the idea that you need to keep the men of the other political party in place. And a lot of the violence is egregious and it's excessive. Because the people who engage in this violence don't know how to inflict violence. So when you think about the murder, this is the, a scene from the murder of a school teacher in his classroom in front of his primary school students. Right? So it's a very gory scenario. And there have been over 200 deaths in these 60-odd uh, years, 4,000 arrests. And it's an ongoing uh, warfare that's going on. So there's this udukkam that needs to be practiced against the RSS to keep it in its place. And very often, this has acquired the nature of a blood feud. So you kill my brother, I kill your brother. And very often, you have people who are studying for their bachelor's degree, 
and back home their brother gets killed, then they are told, hey, you have no other option, you need to kill. And as many of us bourgeois know that given a knife, you don't know what to do with it. You might cut an apple with it, but certainly not spill someone's guts. So many of these deaths are violent in the 54 stab wounds, 65 blows with a hockey stick. It's extraordinary because you actually look at the mathematics of this. There is an excess of violence as young men become men through the course of this and come to identify with a very resurgent and violent masculinity. So there's the udukkam of that. There is the, also the internal udukkam, where the young Turks, the young men within the party are taught about democratic centralism. Right? That there is a hierarchy, you need to behave, you cannot step uh, out of the party line. So the young men within the party itself, communist party, are udukkofied just as much as the RSS is. And then it generates its whole a landscape of Udukam, as it were, where there are these martyr stones that come up. There are martyr stones on the, in the red villages, martyr stones in the saffron villages, the songs, there are, these are celebrated through semi-religious kinds of rituals and so on and so forth. So that's one kind of history. The other kind of history is the idea of feminine comportment. So this for till... Uh, I mean, Malayalam film still has this, right? So that's the idea of the wife, right? Somebody who, the haven from the heartless world, sweetly perfumed, waiting for the husband, you know, constantly uh, attentive to the husband's needs and so on. And this is something that you're familiar with with most Indian cinema, so I don't need to spend too much time on it. Of course, more, more recently, there was a film called The Great Indian Kitchen, which some of you may have watched, which actually, interestingly enough, harks back to in the 1930s, when we had the emergence of a certain kind of feminist writing in Kerala, there was a constant reference to Henry Gibson's Doll's House. And as the literary critics of the time put it, the slam of Nora's, or the sound of Nora slamming the door as she leaves the house, the patriarchal household resounds through Malayali literature. So here, too, in the great Indian kitchen, you have a young woman who enters the house. She's asked to serve the husband, the father-in-law, and so on. And in the end, she dumps dirty kitchen water on her husband and father-in-law and walks out of the house to then enter a dance school, which is a strange end to the film, but we'll leave that there. But the rebellion was at the heart of it. So there's the idea of the wife. But then there's the idea of modern Udukkam. So it's not only the Udukkam of the traditional woman, Right, who is expected to be the wife. You, all of you may have heard about the Shabarimala agitation, the Shabarimala pilgrimage, where uh, only men are allowed and uh, menopausal women and uh, young girls before they attain puberty are allowed. I'm not sure what the logic of this is. The case went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court say, said that this is unconstitutional. Everyone should be allowed uh, access to temples. You all know the temple entry campaigns of the 1920s and so on. So there's a whole history here of access to temples. But then you have these modern looking women practicing modern Udukkam who are saying, we are ready to wait. We don't want to go to Shabarimala, right? We're ready to wait. And so characterized by short hair, by wearing salwar kameez and so on. So you know that they've been to JNU or wherever they've been to. And, but they're still concerned with the idea of Udukkam. Right, that you're willing to wait. Then you have here something that actually rocked Kerala, where Rehana Fatima, who is his artist, uh, lay down in the nude, as it were, and had her little daughter paint over her, paint on her body. Now, this shocked the establishment. It takes very little to shock the Malayali patriarchal establishment. In the 1990s, when we had the emergence of something called Pennaith, women's writing, and the word penna was very consciously used because penna is a Dravidian word as opposed to stri, which is a Sanskritic word. So the use of the word penna caused the Malayali male literary establishment to get really irate, hot and bothered. Uh, the newspapers are full of articles by distinguished Malayali literary critics and novelists. It was called sanitary towel literature. The level of debate was pathetic, ugly, and but we have... As a result of that, we are some of the finest novelists in, uh, writing in Malayalam right now are women, including K.R. Meera, whom some of you may have heard about. So Rehana Fatima is not practicing Udukam in two ways. One, she's a Muslim, right? Or, so there's the idea that, oh, oh, what is happening here? 
and she was also involved in the Shabarimala agitation, right? Where she was saying that women should be allowed to enter Shabarimala. So this became an occasion for a crackdown on her. This issue was resolved only in June 2023, this year, where the court said a woman has the right to autonomy over her body. And it's a Kerala High Court, not a UP High Court, you must remember. So it says the woman has a right to autonomy over her body. But otherwise, the charges that were leveled against her were not only about her utter shamelessness, but the fact that they were, the child was being coerced into what is a sexually violent act. Now, the imagination that goes into something like this is, again, I will leave to your imagination. Then we have this other incident, which is even more trivial, right? Rima Kalingal, who is an actor, a very well-known actor, very outspoken actor, who is considered a, a feminist within the a film space. It takes very little to be considered a feminist in Kerala, sadly enough. So she appeared at a meeting dressed in a short skirt. Right? And you can observe the woman sitting next to her. There's only enough uh, space for her to breathe. Everything, the rest of her is covered. She displays Odukkam, Rima Kalingal does not. And so there was another actor, a uh, female actor, who appeared wearing a uh, dress which revealed her legs and so on. So Rima Kalingal said, we have legs, displaying a complete lack of Odukkam in any manner, right? So these are the, so the word Odukkam for me signifies something that is at the heart of an unreconstructed patriarchy in Kerala. It is about directing male behavior. It is about creating the masculine, but it is also about creating the feminine at the same time. And there is a violence that underlies all of this, right? Whether it is in the creation of the male body as the violent actor, the 55 stab wounds, or is it, or the requirement that uh, young women not show their legs, right? There's an even more recent controversy, again, involving Rima Kalingal, where we had our famous actor, Mamuti, who is now 70. So, and he looks very young, he's very fit, and so he eats only nuts or whatever he eats. So there's, a uh, a photograph of him leaning casually against a wall. So Rima Kalingal has a photograph of herself in a gym costume, uh, standing against a wall. And of course, everybody goes to town on Rima Kalingal saying, you look like an auntie, you're 39 years, dress appropriately. And this is what obsesses the Malayali press and, and a certain class of Malayali men. So in that sense, this word Odukkam for me symbolizes a way of engaging with the language of politics, a language of politics through the idea of a demotic theorizing, a word that is present in everyday conversations on the lips of the auto rickshaw driver, on the lips of a mother, on the lips of a party official, the chief minister like Pinarayi Vijayan, or somebody who requires young women to be an ideal woman in the Malayali imagination. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. We're open for questions, uh, if I may. I was just wondering, uh, 73 uh, is the year of uh, very major events. It's the year of what one may call the other 9-11, because uh, 11 September is the coup against Allende, which uh, was an uh, attempt at a democratic uh, transformation of a communist Marxist government. And uh, the Chile experiment, in a sense, prefigures a lot of what we see as reform in the rest of the world, Chicago boys, military rule. Also, the, the Ramadan war, where, in a sense, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict becomes one of territory rather than of recovery of homeland. Uh, it's also, I was thinking, because, you know, a lot of what you were saying was about the court of Bakhtin, you know, the word is owned by somebody else. And uh, it, it's uncanny, 73 is when Nobel Peace Prize is given to Kissinger. And it's the time when the peace talks are on, uh, but they're bombing North Vietnam. So when you see this 50 year arc, do you think that the 70s, in a sense, set up the stage for a new kind of search, for a new language and politics of emancipation? And this search for theory from a different, uh, locating it outside, or let us say beyond the enlightenment, is it part of that dissolution or is it a new kind of search? I'm sorry, it's a very large question, but when you said 
50 years, I wanted to push you in the ecological direction, but I'll resist the temptation. I'm yeah. sure there are a lot of other better questions. No, actually, this is a vast question. So, uh, and the question of how to think about uh, the uh, a kind of watershed period, uh, a saddle period, as uh, Kuzelek put it, you know, where concepts arise when you think about something like the French Revolution and the coming into existence of new words and ways of being or you think about the late 19th century, 1848, the springtime of the peoples, 1870, the Paris Commune. So about the 70s, one of the things that is happening at that time is that there are three things perhaps that are happening. One is the fact of the late decolonization of Africa. Angola, Mozambique, as Portuguese grimly holds on to its colonies, right? where Decolonization is a fact. France has left Algeria in the 1960s. The Portuguese cling on. They lose Goa in 61, but 70s, they're still clinging on to Africa. So there is this whole process where there is a certain perfidy that is becoming evident, right? Where there is a European perfidy that's becoming evident, where despite the kind of um, rhetoric of democracy, rhetoric of self determination, that Decolonization is not an achieved fact. It still has to be contended for. The second thing that's happening in the 1970s is where America is contending with its own history, right? Because 1945, it emerges as what in international relations is called the hegemon, right? It sounds like a Malayali word, hegemon, right? As opposed to hegemon. So uh, the, America emerges as the hegemon in the, in the 1970s. And there is a kind of unreflectiveness inbuilt into the American enterprise in the world. So you have, uh, in 1945, you have the bombing of civilians with the atom bomb, August 6, 1945, which is seen as necessary. Right? Germany, of course, had, uh, uh, what is it, uh, given up by that point. So somebody had to be bombed. It turned out to be Japan. 1953, you have the Korean War. Then you have the coup in Guatemala in 1953. Multiple, and then, of course, then you have in 1953 also the deposition of a democratically elected government in Iran and the setting up of a monarchy, despite America's professed <laughs> distribution of democratic values across the world. The Vietnam War creates a conjuncture, right, which is a crisis where they, the belief, the self-belief of Americans in their enterprise in the world is challenged by a younger generation. Right? And so then you have the growth of the feminist movement, the black movement, the peace movement, which are saying that we don't have the languages to express this dissatisfaction. So while the decolonized world is searching for a language to engage with the perfidy of a former master, you also have within the US the search for a language that will allow, you know, the, the famous words of, uh, what is it bell hooks? So you can't dismantle the ma master's house with the master. Audrey, Audrey Lode, I'm sorry. Yes, Audrey Lode who says that. So it's, there's, there's, that's the second conjuncture. The third conjuncture could be uh, the oil crisis, right? Where again, the 1973 Gulf oil crisis, where suddenly you realize that the world is oriented towards that the, there is a newer form of colonialism that is waiting on the horizon, right? That is, that is to emerge. And there is also this whole question of the 1970s of the circulation in India. I mean, in India, you see echoes of all of this. The final conjuncture is the third conjuncture is that of the failure of the idea of Euro-Africa, right? and which is what leads then to the consolidation of the European Union. Because once Europe realizes that it cannot survive with its colonies, there is an attempt within Europe to generate the idea of Euro-Africa. And as you know, there have been uh, arguments about uh, within Senegal, et cetera, of forming a federation rather than nations. And so the idea of evolving a new language of politics, which is looking at the emergence of the idea of neocolonialism, which Kwame Nkrumah had spoken about and has picked up. 
So there is a whole conjuncture within the, there is an inadequacy of concepts. There is no inheritance to work with that is untainted. The idea of democracy itself is enshrined in a country that consists in the non-practice of democracy and so on and so forth. So I think it's a crucial conjuncture. I mean, uh, I don't know whether that's an adequate answer when you asked a big question, so it's forced to think on my feet. But I think what's happening here again is a question that's valid for us because if one thinks about uh, the emergence of uh, the uh, black movements in you at the Black Panther Party, or you think about uh, black feminism, what they're trying to do is to think about the creation of a new language, a new language of civic belonging, a new language of equality, which can't be a mere inheritance, right? And it is a language that is powered by rage, which does not conform to the civil comportment, displays no udukkam, so to speak. Right? It's, trying to, it's, it's trying to break free of the restraints of a civilized bourgeois exchange. So it is a crucial conjuncture. Anyway, I, I could go on like this because I'm continuing to think on my feet. I should just stop. Thank you, Dilip. That talk was sparkling and uh also sparking thoughts. Uh, two questions. Um, there have been these attempts to try and compile uh, new kinds of dictionaries or word collections. Some of them are to look at the way in which English has been appropriated in different contexts. So there was a special issue of the journal South Asia, which took English words like time pass and history sheeter and looked at how they had been um, in a way, appropriated and domesticated in India, a bit like you know Chinese cuisine comes and becomes Gobi Manchurian. So that hey, process... Kerala, Gobi, Gobi Manjuri, Gobi Manjuri, not even Gobi Manjuri. <laughs> there you go. Um, so my question about the exercise that you're describing is that is it in some ways a kind of um, an opposing move, which is that you're looking at vernacular words, but vernacular words which um, in a way take on new meanings, partly because of the colonial encounter, because uh, clearly they, they don't exist in a context which is pristine. So what is the influence of colonialism on these sorts of vernacular terms that existed from before? Does the idea of dharma change uh, when you have an English notion of duty? That, uh, that comes in. So that was one question. Uh, the other was about your brief reference to the Anthropocene. And, uh, you know, the idea with the global South is that there has to be a global. And you're saying that the crisis of the Anthropocene points to that. But what it also then, I think, what, what is, uh, you know, a sort of, um, what follows from your theory, what's a corollary, is that then we also need, in some ways, universal theories. So just to have particularisms and putting them all together in this kind of nice mosaic is not going to cut it. So if the crisis of the Anthropocene demands a, a, you know, a challenge in terms of theorization, which people have responded to in terms of saying it's actually a capital C or Anna saying it's a plantation C. Yeah. So where do you see this work with language and with reclaiming and recovering space, uh, speaking to the imperative to have a more universal theory. Yeah, actually, I think the thing is that uh, we, one of the colonial legacies that we have is that we have the idea of a universal and then we have the idea of particularisms. Whereas the very idea of the universalism is a particularism writ large through violence. How does European particularism become universal? Through global violence. A language is a dialect marked mark by an army. So let's put that aside for the moment. Yeah. 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 I, and so we are looking at beginning to look at the idea of many forms of universal thinking, right? Like the Chinese scholars are now doing with the idea of Tianxia, all under heaven, right? Or so when we think about what am I doing here, I'll just go backward from the questions. What are we doing here? We are trying to re-articulate the idea of the universal 
because the universal is can be expressed in multiple ways in multiple languages, right? So if you, uh, the idea of the universal is engaged with in Marathi, as well as Malayalam, Bengali, and so on. So a word like Odukkam actually speaks to a history of Europe. It speaks to a history of the US, right? As well, which is why I deliberately bought in the word Odukkam to speak about the eruption of language in the 1970s. So this question of particularism and universalism, what are we doing? Is it just a question of stitching together many particularisms to make the universal? I think the, I, I would like to drop this vocabulary. There are multiple forms of universal thinking. It's just that colonialism has made us engage with an idea of the universal. And as in the case of the Hegelian dialectic of the master and the slave, the master does not require the recognition of the slave. So Europe doesn't care. I find an incredible degree of lethargy when I travel in the US and in Europe, the people don't read, right? In the ways that we are compelled to read, if at all, we are to become intellectually relevant. I mean, so for example, I mean, I could draw upon Levinas, Heidegger and so on, and you could find an average uh, European philosopher who's not even read anything about Buddhism or and this is considered all right. So that's, an, that's not a merely polemical point, but I think it's important to realize that we are all articulating universal positions. It's not a stitching together of particularisms to get. To. So the first question, with regard to the kinds of volumes that we have had, and the multiple volumes, Rukmini Bhayanaya's volume, which uh, takes up this idea of time pass and Jugaad and you know, various uh, kinds of ideas, you also have a certain kind of intransigences as in Barbara Cassin's Dictionary of Untranslatables, where, the, where she says in a brief note at the beginning that, look, we don't engage with any non-European words. And you think, why? Is it because you're ignorant? Is it because you're lazy? Why is it that you don't engage with non-European words? Do you not have people who can do it for you? I mean, if you don't know it, at least get someone else to do it. So there's this kind of intellectual arrogance that is built into that enterprise. Or you have the kind of business as usual work. So, Anna uh, Tsing and Carol Gluck have edited this book called Words in Motion. And what it does is look at words like security, secularism, and uh, as they travel around the world, they acquire different meanings in Indonesia. And, and you think, you know, look, we have a rich language tradition of our own. Right? It's interesting for you, perhaps, that, hey, they've taken up a word that we know, and it's acquired a different meaning. And that's the only agency allowed here. Right? The only agency allowed to the native is in the transformation of an inherited word. So what is happening here in the, as a result of the colonial encounter, there are two possibilities, which is what I began with. Right? As a result of the colonial encounter, one can either think that, look, there's something that's been lost to us, and let us recover that. Right? And that is not something that is immediately possible. So hence the move to the demotic. Or one can engage in the kind of exercise that uh, is, I think, somewhat glib. So if you remember um, Ranajit Guha's work in which he says that one of the ways in which colonialism managed to create a certain paradigm of rule within India is that it drew upon Indian concepts. So you think about bhakti, danda, dharma, right? So bhakti creates the structures of obedience and fealty. Danda creates the order of, uh, creates the idea of order through violence, a legitimate kind of violence exercised by the sovereign. Dharma, your duty, and, and so on and so forth. Now this is kind of, uh, I think, very easily done, right? It's kind of moves, but on the other hand, Ranajit Guha also began a rather difficult enterprise, which he then abandoned. And I was speaking about this earlier, where in the elementary aspects of peasant insurgency in colonial India, a book that is determined by French post-structuralism, post there is a footnote, a fascinating footnote, which I rediscovered when I went back, right? And I was reading the things that I read when I was in my 30s and so on. A fascinating footnote where at the heart of uh, elementary aspects, some of you may remember, some of you may not, is the idea of the atidesha function, right? That when a peasant in a state of rebellion attacks the money lender, logically, he then attacks the zamindar. 
and that leads to a logical extension to attacking the Sarkar, right? So the Sahukar to Sarkar kind of continuum, which he takes from Panini's Ashtadhyayi, right? The Atidesha function, which is, exists in grammar, this logical extension. That is a, an enterprise that he could do, but it requires a certain kind of scholarship and an engagement which is, I think, very difficult for me. And it's quite difficult to begin with. It demands a knowledge of languages. It demands a language of philosophical traditions. And I'll just stop with this example because I mean, we could go on. I mean, these questions spark for so many things. There's Duncan Derrett's Religion, Law, and State in India. And he talks about the 18th century encounter of colonialism of East India Company with the local traditions of philosophy, right? local philosophers. And one of the things that happens is that the East India Company is interested in rule. The philosophers are interested in cogitation. Right? Now, when these two come together, the East India Company says, look, we are consulting you as a pundit. Here is this guy who's killed his wife. Is he guilty or not guilty? The philosopher then begins to speculate as to what the person was killed with, what time of day it was, what condition of mind the person who killed it. If they used an axe, did he kill the wife with the blade? Did he kill the wife with the haft of the axe? And so on and so forth. And the East India Company says, enough. You know, like, tell us whether a person is guilty or not. And slowly what you have is what Derrick calls responsiveness. So you have the generation of responsive texts where entire traditions of philosophy are subordinated to this instrumentalist enterprise. So when we say, go back, go back to what? Do we go back to the time before colonialism and what existed there? Is, there? is there something there to recover? So I think these are complicated issues. And so just mulling over this is what led me to the idea of the demotic. So let's work with what we have and think. It's some, some of it may require, if I were to work with the idea of dharma, I could probably go back to Patrick Oliver, right, on that massive tomb, and then try and engage with how the idea of dharma is spoken about every day. Ye tumara dharma, tum karo. You know, the toilet you know, this kind of the, the casual brutality of Indian society can be studied through this. But I'll stop there. Awesome. There's, there's Brigu and uh, yeah, there's Brigu and Rasma. And then uh, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, and uh, I, I will apologize for my inability to be brief. No, no, that's fine. You don't have to be brief. So nice, very nice to hear you, Dilip. Uh, and to also know after many years that one is still has resonant interest. So for the past few years, I've been working on a project called Steps to a Global Thought, which yeah. is doing something very different. But one of the basic questions we're asking is how do concepts relate to territories and how do concepts cross territories, not just as a function of power, mm -hmm. uh, but as forms of attraction and other ways. And I think one of the worries we express in that it's still in progress and yet to be published, but soon to be out hopefully, but one of the worries that what's happening in contemporary philosophy or theory, very much in the dictionary of untranslatables, is a ossification and an impoverishment of even the idea of Europe, uh, because their own precursors, for example, they cite themselves as being the tradition of Benevenese. Benevenese dictionary of Indo-European concepts is a absolutely brilliant uh, mapping of how concepts move, like the concept of a deity, etc. And the reason I invoke the Indo-European is to that. Is it that we are participating not in nativism, but in the perpetuation of a certain geography that depends on certain kind of definition of language, territory, etc., uh, which was actually quite more imaginatively mapped, and there are other ways of mapping the movement of concepts or ter across territories, uh, as with the concept of Indo-European, such that the reason I'm saying that that the term you keep using our own, um, I find, for example, one of the problems I faced was a completely impoverished way of thinking about popular religion, for example, right. in which I found that, uh, say, a myth in Rajasthan, I found it much more able to read that myth in relation to transformations of myth in the Indo-European corpus of myths, such that Rajasthan may actually find its own in Iran or Scotland, where you see the same cattle raiding myth being transformed. So, so I'm wondering if your conception of concept and territory is still too wedded to a certain kind of modern geography. Um, 
in which uh, what happens in the transformation is actually impoverished both our idea of Europe and our notion of what is our own, such that even the rise of a deity like Krishna, for example, the Bhagavad Puran has to cross 11 linguistic regions to become a North Indian text. Uh, so I would say that part of this would be the central question of how you cross territories or what a conception of translation would look like, not just as an imposition of power. Very good. I mean, I mean, I think it connects up with the question of universal that uh, Amita raised as well. Right? What is the place of thinking? Right. So when we think about Europe, the idea of uh, Europe is impoverished in its amnesia regarding its Arabic past. Right. For one, right. That many what it considers as the fount of philosophy, Greece. Many of those ideas are rendered and translated, and this is something that's fairly common knowledge. Right. The other thing is that when we think about any of the ideas in our space, they are inflected by ideas of migration, movement, layers of uh, the uh, colonial conquest as much as, and not only the British, you know, you can go back to the Scythians and the Parthians and so on. So we are talking about these constantly expanding and contracting spaces, right? So when one thinks about a word, right, the word is what I choose to think with. These are also questions of preferences. Right? What I'm not proposing is not democratic centralism, the idea that I will hand to you, my son. Right? I mean, it's a fact that we all think with the grain of our being. This is what I want to think with. So if you think about a word like uh, any of these words that one thinks about, the word Odukkam could be put into a much larger landscape of Indian Oceanic Islam. Right? And practices that take you to West Asia, it could take you to Southeast Asia, and so on. But it's a question, is that a beginning to work with a word and to explore then the conceptual entailments and the world of the word, right? And that's where I would like to go. So it's not about limiting it to any, so when I say our, it's all a gesture of affinity, it's also a polemical gesture, right? Hum, hum Hindustani kind of thing. But, but that, that aside, I think every word has to be explored not in its some kind of autochthonous, mushroomy sense, right? Something that sprouts. Uh, willy nilly in a landscape, but that it has these filiations. And these filiations are unexpected, they are vast, they are contingent, they are conjunctural, there are geographies that are forgotten. Right? So take, take a very simple example, right? When you think about the emergence of Thagi, right, in central India, the reason why Thagi emerges is that for a brief point, cotton from Madhya Pradesh was being sold to China. And there's a huge boom in the economy. Then that bubble bursts and suddenly Madhya Pradesh becomes Madhya Pradesh. And these guys have nowhere to go. And then they resort to uh, criminal activities and so on in the middle of a drought and so on and so forth. So suddenly that vast landscape that connected the villages in Madhya Pradesh to China and to a global economy. Similarly, why does uh, Jyoti Bafule in 1873 when he writes Gulam Giri, he dedicates the book to the slaves, right? The freed slaves of America. Immediately prior to this, Maharashtra had been supplying cotton to the world because the civil war, American civil war was going on and American cotton was no longer available, right? So there are these contingencies of scale that one needs to be, and that will depend upon the word that one chooses, right? And this question of our, for me, is the political gesture, right? That we bear the scars of colonialism here. When I think from India, and when I think from South Africa, the politics of location matters. Were I in Europe, I would think differently. And there is a politics of location. When the students in 2016 told us that what the university is teaching us is not what we want to learn. And then we were forced to rethink our entire syllabi. What we teach in 2023 is not what was taught in 2016. Right? Our entire, to give you an example, our entire anthropology course got flipped. So we began with the great white men, you know, Radcliffe, Richard, Evans, you know, Radcliffe uh, Brown, Evans, Richard, Strauss, uh, Durkheim, et cetera, et cetera. Then you moved on to African notions of community. Now we flipped the course so that people begin with African notions of community, person, territory, and so on and so forth. And then we teach the big theorists at the end, and by which time they're seen as irrelevant by many of the students. They say, well, it doesn't answer. Their questions are not my questions. They begin to feel easy. Right? 
So I think there is this, we have to be a supple, flexible, and work with the grain of our being. And we have to work from where we are. Right? A lot of it also, a lot of our theoretical orientations do not come to us out of books. It comes out of a politics that we are part of, right, in a particular area. So that's really where, I mean, it's a kind of long answer, shaggy dog answer, but there it is. Dr. Gorn, just three o'clock. Yeah, so we'll conclude. Three o'clock. The seminar comes to an end. Oh. People can 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 continue informally. There are people who want to talk to you. But I want to really thank uh, Dilip, and please do come back again. Uh, this is not the first time you're uh, at Ashoka, and I'm sure it won't be the last. And thank you all so very much. I, I'm sorry there were people who had to leave. I'm sure there were more uh, questions, which is testament to uh, what a scintillating and stimulating talk it's been. Thank you. And we don't agree, many of us, with anything you said. So please do come. <laughs> No, no, please stay. Please explain. I'm not going to let you go. <laughs> Hello? Over coffee. <laughs> uh, Anything to have the last word? He eh? needs filter uh, coffee. He needs filter coffee. He's not here. I mean, it's, I, I apologize. Eh? I apologize. Good to see you, Vikas. <laughs>